Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast Midweek Supplemental Show. Coming up, a cool new snub nose tanto from Best Tech, a Kramer custom knife barges its way into my EDC, and the unsung cutters of my knife collection. These are actual knives that get actual use for actual cutting. We're gonna talk about that coming up. But first, the first opportunity of the show to show off a knife, uh, or two, or three in this case. Uh, my EDC, what am I carrying today? It's kind of funny to say my EDC because I don't carry anything every day. Uh, but a couple of these, or one of these, is kind of making its way in that way. So. Let me just start with the Les George VSEP. I used to call this the VECP, but uh, learned from Mr. George himself that it's the VSEP. Um, this is his first and maybe one of the first uh, mid-tech knives out, of, out there. I remember when this came out and everyone was saying, Sabenza killer? Uh, that the fact that this was a mid-tech was a big deal. And uh, that's kind of when I remember the term mid-tech being birthed, painful as it was. Um, now the term kind of has gotten muddy um, because everyone uses at some point, or many, 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 most people at some point in their process use some outside labor to cut out blanks or to, to cut out handle material or stuff like that. It just kind of makes sense uh, if you're going to try and do like a, a, a small run out of a production shop. Anyway, this uh, is titanium, as you would imagine, and this is XHP steel. And the gentleman that I got this from, uh, from Singapore, put a an absolutely gorgeous uh, mirror polished edge on this knife. It is extremely sharp. One thing I really love about this knife is its action. It's got that kind of action that uh, is frequently referred to as hydraulic. It's on uh, bronze washers and it just very smoothly comes out with just a smooth and slight bit of resistance um, and goes back in the same way. So this thing has an incredible action. And uh, let me show you this beautiful little detail here. Look at the chamfering around the cutout for the lock bar. Just class all the way. So, uh, a couple of high-end knives that I have, like very expensive knives, right here, you can feel it's it's sharp and rough. Okay, I'll just say it. My Strider, I go like this, and I could, I could, uh, you know, I could peel a carrot on the edge of this cutout. And the way uh, Les George put on this beautiful chamfer here, just is a little bit of extra attention to detail that, um, you know, makes me happy. I don't need this. I, I kind of wish he didn't tap it for tip down, but uh, maybe that was a sign of the times when this was made. People people were, were very hyped on options. Now I think people have chilled out a little bit about that, uh, except maybe not lefties. Another thing is just the chamfering all the way around the handle. Gorgeous. So this knife has uh, inspired the SBR, the uh, Rock Eye Auto, and um, the SBR Fixed Blade from ProTech. Um, the Rock Eye is the custom model that this VSEP Midtech was uh, born from. So they went back to the original name for the ProTech versions. So carrying this today, love this knife. Uh, it is one of those, uh, it was a grail knife for me. I searched and searched and then gave up the search. And then it uh, appeared to me one day hovering over my bed in a glowing mist. And uh, I snatched it up. Uh, next, I am carrying the, uh, before the, subtle and sheeple style cutting. I, I know I will be out in the world today. Uh, I have the GEC number 14. This was the run from, what was it, 2018, I believe. And uh, I'll, I will check the blade in just a second. But it has this wonderful combination of clip point blade with that beautiful classic uh, slip joint clip point, slip joint clip point, uh, style uh, blade with <laughs> with the uh, the dipping down edge and the machine cut swedge and the uh, long pull, which is just beautiful. 
this has been patinaed and then brought back to a polish, so I've lost a bit of the uh, the marking on the blade, the etching, pretty much all of it. And uh, very sharp. I've gotten it that way. This did not arrive to me super sharp, but I I sharpened the Dickens out of it, and it is now quite uh, quite the scalpel, especially the little pen blade, which I leave uh, sort of unsullied. I, I don't really use it unless I must. Um, and as you can imagine, yeah, 2018, you can see right there. Two standing for how many blades, 18 for the year of manufacture. And then since it's such a small blade, they split the serial number up. And on the front, uh, number 14. And number one there stands for the main blade style, which is clip point uh, in the GEC nomenclature. It's got one of my favorite handle covers here. This is an autumn jig bone or yeah, autumn jig bone with the little peach seed jigging really gives a nice grip and then bolsters on both ends. Love this knife. Uh, the third knife I'm carrying today is a fixed blade and I'm not going to show it because I've done this before. Uh, it will show up in the state of the collection. I will uh, go on and on about it there, but I'm not going to show it here. Um, it's sort of a technique from the business. Uh, you know, it's a teaser. Uh, here, I'll do it real quickly. Here it is. I'll show it to you in a little while. Uh, but I will be carrying that. I've, I've got, I've, let's see, I got this Kramer Custom Voodoo uh, at this point about a week ago. And I've carried it every day, all day, even, even with the, uh, even with the sweat shorts at night, you know, even in the jammies, it, it's light, thin, and uh, it is awesome. It's just such a great knife. And uh, I love carrying it. It carries so easily. And I love a fixed blade knife that carries so easily because we shouldn't be limited just to folders all the time, you know? Just because we're not Grizzly Adams doesn't mean that we can't carry a uh, a fixed blade every now and again. I just got distracted putting this 14 away because I, I have to show off the walk and talk on this main blade. It is uh, just fantastic. Got that nice half stop. Here, I'll do it in front of the mic, too, so you can hear the walk and talk. Oh, yeah. So uh, there we go. That's what I'm carrying today, and that's what I'm sticking with. Uh, let us know what you're carrying. I always love to find out uh, what everyone has in their pocket uh, during the day. And it's funny, I get, uh, I'll get emails every now and again that just says uh, one thing, like, uh, best tech malware. I'm like, what is this referring to? Oh, yeah, I'm always saying, let me know what you're carrying. So people are answering. Um, I love it. <laughs> Context is awesome, too, but I don't need it. I don't need it. Uh, just let me know what you're carrying. Or you can call the listener line 744-724-466-4487 and uh, let us know what you're carrying that way on the listener line. Um, 724-466-4487. Uh, but first, help support the show here on Patreon. Uh, we've gotten, well, we're up to 27 members and thank you one and all. Um, we have a recent, we have two recent um, members. We have uh, Sean and we have Ryan. Thank you guys both so much. Um, we really, really appreciate you coming on the show, coming and joining us. Um, and as a matter of fact, Ryan just won the Gentleman Junkie uh, giveaway, which is the Kershaw Strata XL. He won that on Thursday Night Knives this past week. And Sean uh, purchased a knife I put up for sale on exclusive, exclusively on sale um, on the Patreon page. He bought uh, an off-grid knife from me. So uh, very, very uh, grateful for that and grateful for their support. If you want to come and support the show, uh, please do go to Patreon and uh, uh you know, you get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the show, early access to the Sunday interview and midweek supplemental shows. You get monthly knife giveaways. And we're cooking up some new and exciting exclusive opportunities. One of these was just that uh, that knife sale, which uh, if people don't snatch it up in about a week, then I'll go broader with it and, and go over to Blade Forums or something like that. Uh, your support really helps the show keep growing, and we really appreciate that. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to get there is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So Knife Life 
news is the spot where we talk about new knives dropping and uh, well, knives in news stories. But you know what? Uh, I've stopped doing a lot of knives in news stories recently because uh, they're either depressing, sad, or controversial. And uh, no need for that on this show. This is a happy knife show. So uh, I'm going to talk about knife drops. And we got two. And uh, this first one is very interesting to me. It is a knife named after a blunt instrument, kind of like uh, we had the very daggery, uh, very pointy and acute tipped um, Spyderco nightstick that came out last year. And, and it's still, you know, I think it's a play on words. One of the one of our viewers commented, said, I think it's supposed to be like night stick, like you stick it in someone. But to me, it's just a corny name for a beautiful daggery shaped blade, the nightstick. Well, we have this again from Best Tech this time. And um, I really like the knife, kind of like the night, the nightstick, really like the look of the knife. <laughs> but the name is just funny to me uh, for something sharp. Uh, this is the new Best Tech sledgehammer, kind of interesting sledgehammer. I mean, it's it's like calling a Lamborghini. It's like coming out with a super aerodynamic car and being like, this is the Lamborghini brick. We're going to call this the brick. Um, this is the best tech sledgehammer. And I guess the name is to evoke the fact that uh, it's sturdy and stout, I guess. But this is a three inch blade, just under three inches. So it's not even a very big knife, but it's really got my attention. It's got a, a D2 Tanto blade that has the most steep uh, front portion of the blade. I mean, to me, this is almost, um, it's almost like a, a, a razzle, you know, the, um, the Graham knives razzle. It's, it's almost like that, but it's got a little bit of curve on that front portion. Uh, it's a, it's a Tanto that takes some cues from the Chris Reeve knives Tanto, uh, but it takes it to an extreme. Um, no doubt it's super sharp up there and you can punch that through just about anything. But the tip is, you know, it's just a very uh, obliquely designed tip. And then you've got about a three inch or I guess 2.75 inch run of slightly curved straight. Yes, slightly curved straight on that blade. And uh, it looks like a very effective work knife. Three inches. I, I wouldn't mind it being a lot larger, but three inches and four different titanium, I mean, four different uh, handle materials. You can get three kinds of micarta, black, green, or that natural tan canvas micarta, or it also comes in an orange G10, which might be might be actually pretty nice. Uh, the Sledgehammer from Best Tech, it's going to be a sub $50 or sub $100 knife. I'm not sure exactly what it's coming in at, and, and it's about four ounces heavy. So uh, liner lock, as you might expect from those handle materials. And interesting, just a little bit different. Best Tech is good for that, coming out with something just a little bit different. And uh, this is the one that has a, a bit of appeal to me. And I, I do think it has to do with that funny shaped Tanto blade. So check out the Best Tech Sledgehammer and a very nice article of that over on uh, Knife News. I love Ben Schwartz's writing. Every day he comes out with a new way to talk about a knife that we've, you know, uh, whose parts we've seen before. I mean, he can make a titanium frame lock sound new and exciting. I love that guy's writing. So uh, definitely check out Knife News. Uh, that's also where I learned about this next knife, the new in-house designed Wii Upshot. This knife uh, I saw, let's see, Thursday Night Knives, we, we glanced at it ever so slightly as we were talking about a new Civivi. And the topic of the show was, um, what do we like better? Do we like companies like Spyderco coming out with uh, new iterations of old knives, you know, endlessly rehashing them with new materials? Um, that sounds negative, but it, it's sort of positive too. Or do we like these infinite new models from Civivi, for instance, where they just keep pumping out new models that look just ever so slightly different from the last one. And then they call it something weird and, uh, you know, send it out into the world. Well, this had just come out and I didn't have a chance to really look at it uh, before Thursday Night Knives, but I have now. And I actually kind of really like this knife. Uh, the blade is just under three and a half inches. So uh, a 
is 3.47. So it's it's just barely in my wheelhouse for blade sizes. Uh, what is this? I think it's 20 CV. Yeah, it's 20 CV. So it's a great blade steel. And uh, as as you look at the blade, it's sort of drop point, sort of Warren Cliff. I, I think it's uh, it's walking the line between the two of those. And and like I say a lot, everything's a drop point. Everything is a modified drop point if you think about it. Almost everything, except a Persian. You know, you could call that an ultra modified drop point. I guess. Uh, in any case, the the upshot is designed in house. And it's got that beautifully utilitarian looking blade. It's got a nice point to it, which I like, and a nice belly to it, gradual and uh, sort of full bladed belly. Um, the two things that I really like about it though, the, the blade to handle ratio is, is right on point for me. And look at that super ridiculously neutral handle. I mean, you could hold that in any grip uh, with, equal comfort something about the audacity of the plainness this audaciously plain um and neutral handle is a real turn on to me i just think it's kind of classy also it looks very comfortable and then they they put that swedge up in the front so really the only bit of ergonomic um what do we want to specificity to this is in the blade itself not even in the handle so that little choil up there uh, could give you some added, you know, purchase if you needed to, uh, to feel like you needed extra control with this knife. But I mean, I think it's all about control. It's totally neutral. You've got a run of jimping. You've got a, a, a perfectly shaped blade with an, with an excellently shaped handle. And then the one little bit of flourish is that pocket clip. Uh, the pocket clip is, you know, heat anodized and has the one little bit of flashiness to this whole knife. Excuse me, the one thing that I bristle at, I do not like holes like that, um, speed holes or lightning holes or whatever you wanna call them, uh, drilled into pocket clips, especially on nice knives, on fine, expensive knives. To me, it looks cheap. To me, it's evocative of gas station knives and I just don't like it. Uh, so I kind of wish they didn't drill those holes in there, but I really like the splash of color with the clip there. So uh, as Ben says there, a bit of unexpected flourish. So um, yeah, this wee upshot is nice. Now you're not going to see me running out and buying it because my tastes in my old age have, have become very particular, I've noticed. Um, this for a wee, I, I'm really digging. And for a sort of I hate to put it this way, but run of the mill we, I really, really like, but uh, yeah, I don't see myself running out and getting it. However, in a trade, it might be an interesting uh, a temptation. So a uh, very interesting new in-house designed Wii knife, the upshot. Um, yeah, tell me what you think. Do you like this knife? Is it, uh, is it, is it exciting enough to, to be another Wii design? Um, are they coming out with too many designs? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I think yes. Sometimes I think no. Sometimes it's just hard to keep them straight. Um, I, I understand that that the knife world is a is a burgeoning uh, community, and uh, you know people are really becoming collectors. Uh, myself, I always thought collectors were weird until I discovered and counted how many knives I had and realized I guess I'm a bit of a collector too. And we all have our peccadillos and our tastes and this and that, uh, but. You know, are there too many knives coming out? I don't know. Can't tell. Can't tell. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, please, on this. Uh, and then uh, we'll know that you're there and that you like what's coming out. Still to come on the Knife Junkie Midweek Supplemental, we have our State of the Collection. And uh, we also take a look at some knives that are unsung heroes in my collection. Maybe not the most glamorous and glorious knives, but they're the ones that are around the house and get actual use kind of consistently. Well, not kind of, they get consistent use um, cutting because they're right at hand. Some of them are junk drawer knives. Some of them are knives that just uh, one resides on my desk. One lives in my backpack and is my work, one of something for work. So these are the things that are always there that I choose instead of maybe the fancy thing that I'm carrying in my pocket. I know, I know, hashtag use your stuff, but this is just what it is, so I'm, I'm going to show you. 
but before we dig into that, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, as I mentioned, and hit the notification bell, which theoretically will let you know each time we upload a video here. And join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives, our weekly live stream. It's getting livelier and livelier every week. Uh, you have the opportunity to come on and just go to thenifejunkie.com slash join, set up your camera, and light would be nice. Put in some headphones and meet me and talk and meet the other people who come on and talk. We it, it's like uh, it's like basically the Oprah of knife shows. You know, we get guests on there. We get uh, uh, just great topics of conversation and lively lively talk. 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and uh, while well, that's right here on YouTube, uh, that's Thursday Night Knives. Please join us 10 p.m. Eastern right here on YouTube. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. So this past weekend, uh, after I was done mowing the lawn and devining the place, I live in Virginia and the vines here are just insane. Um, they really are. It's like you can see them growing in 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 real time. <laughs> it's like they're like it's like an alien invasion every summer. Speaking of alien invasion, we also have the cicadas here. So, I mean, it's a it's a double alien invasion. Uh, Seventeen year cicadas are 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 on the on the move and getting loud. Holy mackerel! Anyway, after I was done doing all that stuff in the yard. I had some knife repair and knife sharpening to do. Uh, I've had a knife around here from my mother-in-law for a year, just kind of collecting dust that I said, oh, I'll, I'll sharpen that for you. And then uh, just finally got around to you. So I did that. And uh, I had a knife that I'm going to show you that I made a while ago that I've shown off, but I finally put an edge on it, did a little finishing touches on it. And uh, I'm going to show you that too. But first, as I I don't say I want to do it. I don't say I like to do it. I just do it with some regularity. I drop knives on their tips and break them. And I had two uh, kitchen knives that I did that with. One I dropped on our, you know, we have a hard tile floor and it dropped right on the tip and ding. And, uh, and then the second one, I must admit, I tossed in anger in the sink a couple weeks back and it landed funny in the drain and it chipped off a piece. Uh, I think I was trying to make a point and no one was around to 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 get, <laughs> to get the point. And I broke the point on this damn knife. So uh, I had to fix these two. They're both wedding knives. And uh, uh, when, when it was time to register for our wedding, 13 and a half, almost 14 years ago, baby, uh, I selected these Shun knives. And Shun, these are knives made by um, Kai USA. And they're the people who make the uh, Kershaw knives and the ZT knives uh, and the Shun knives. And these have not been, well, I have some Wusthof Trident knives and I like them better. Let me put it that way. Uh, but I was taken in by the Damascene look of the blades and the interesting designs. They even had a chef's knife designed by Ken Onion that I never ended up getting, but just a beautiful chef's knife. Uh, so I got these and... They, they don't really hold an edge very well, uh, but they're they're ours and they're our wedding knives. So I will always cherish them. Um, and they're thinly ground. I will give them that. But when I first got them, I, I was going to bring them into a, or no, I was, where was I? I was at uh, one of the um, kitchen su uh, supply places. Um, what's the fancy pants one? I can't remember what it's called now, but I was in there and I, and there was a guy sharpening knives and I said, Oh, I, I, uh, I have some shun knives and I was trying to just strike up a conversation. And I said, uh, but you know, I sharpen them myself. And, and he's like, uh, myself. And he says, Oh, Oh really? Do you? Well, you know that one side is on a 20 de degree angle and the other side is on a 19 degree angle. And so you can't sharpen them yourself. And I was like, I'm not sure if he was being truthful or not. I never actually really looked into it, but I thought that's horse crap. If they have two edges at, at different angles and it's not a chisel point, uh, chisel edge, then you're just being a little ridiculous. And if they're so close that they're only like two or three degrees off, then I know you're just BSing me here. So 
uh, either shun or the sharpening guy. So in any case, uh, always had some mixed feelings about, about these knives. This one is the paring knife. I dropped it on its tip and it just uh, came down in a nice graceful swoop and then boom, just chopped off at the end. So I took this to the Craftsman 2 by 42 inch grinder here and gave it a little clip point there. And now it looks kind of like a sax, like a broke back sax, doesn't it? Kind of a neat little uh, uh, fix to this knife. And now I like the way it looks better, which you know how important that is to me. Uh, but also I feel like that angle there is going to be less mm, problematic when it comes to dropping it. I, am I wrong? I might be wrong. Maybe it looks like I made an even more uh, delicate tip there, but uh, we'll see. This will be a work in progress. Maybe I need to angle it up at the tip, but I do like having that much usable uh, cutting edge right up to the tip there. So did that with this. That was just an incidental drop. Happens all the time, unfortunately. Uh, but this one, this is the chef's knife, and this is a 10-inch chef's knife, um, which when it's sharp is great because it's really nice and thin. Uh, but I do have to keep it, I do have to work on the edge somewhat frequently. This one, um, you know, someone upset me. I don't remember who, uh, but I have some really, I uh, have two excellent pets and three excellent humans living in this house. But, you know, sometimes three other, you know, excellent humans, because I consider myself the fourth excellent human in this house. But sometimes we get on each other's nerves. Sometimes we anger each other. Let's just put it that way. And uh, I was doing dishes as I do. And uh, <laughs> did you did you sense a little resentment there? It isn't. I like doing the dishes. It's a chance to listen to great podcasts like this one. But uh, I, I sort of threw this knife in anger into the sink chucked it. I didn't throw it. I chucked it. I just sort of like very, uh, very aggressively placed it in the sink. And wouldn't you know, the tip went right down the drain into the incinerator and snapped off. And it was an ugly looking U-shaped gouge at the end of, end of this blade. Gouge isn't even the right term. It was more like a U-shaped a feature at the end of this blade. And uh, so... <sighs> I, I missed about, I, I, let's see, I lost, I should say, about three quarters of an inch on this knife, but I did the same thing that I did with the paring knife and gave it an angle down to the tip there, as you can see. And let me put this back and down there. And now it, I'm more inspired to use it because it looks sort of like a Viking chef's knife. So, well... You don't need a two by 42 or a two by 72 or anything special like that to, to do this. I mean, mine is just a run of the mill craftsman, uh, but don't forget if you jack up your knives, you can fix them, you can alter them, you can sharpen them even on, uh, on some pretty rudimentary machines. And I'm glad to have this back. And now this is a new era for this somewhat mediocre shun knife. I'm wondering, did Shun uh, over the past years, I mean, they're still making knives, unlike some other companies that were uh, that were fashionable when I got this, like Globals, they were very expensive and and weird looking knives and and uh, like all the finest, all the best people had them for that period of time and they seem to have disappeared. I think it's because they were an ergonomic nightmare uh, in, in, in the service of just looking kind of futuristic. Uh, but the Shun knives are still around. And I'm wondering, did they change the steel? Did they change their heat treat since these early, um, early versions of them uh, just to stay, stay relevant and stay in the market? I, I'm not sure. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to find out if, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll ask someone from Kai at Blade Show, which is coming up. Can't wait for Blade Show. It's coming up. Got to get the car, got to get the brakes fixed a little bit. Uh, you know, the brakes have been just, I need to replace the brake pads. I'm going to be driving down to Hotlanta from here. That's what they used to say in the late nineties, kids, Hotlanta. Uh, so yeah, going to go down there and I'm very excited. So maybe I'll go to the Kai table and ask them uh, if they changed the steel on these shun knives. Be very interested to find out. All right. Next in the state of the collection, another little project that I finally put to bed out at the grinder yesterday 
is my Road Warrior Shank, which is uh, inspired by Fred Perrin. Uh, this right here is a, I think it's cool uh, looking knife that I had. Uh, this is made from another knife. I, I designed a, excuse me, I made some big giant Bowie that just wasn't working out. Uh, and before I heat treated it, I decided to cut this shape out of the Bowie. And then I had some scrap steel I did other stuff with. But I, I wanted a knife that I could carry on my belt and on my, uh, you know, kind of in the waistband as a an EDC fixed blade tactical knife. And it sort of spiraled out of control. This is a little bit big and heavy for me to do that with. And um, I sent it off to Alex Steingraber for uh, heat treatment. And he did a beautiful job. This is AEBL stainless steel. But before I did... I didn't drill holes in for the handle. And uh, uh, I mentioned this on a Thursday Night Knives, and we had folks like Lindy Lou say, oh, you know, just carbide build dr uh, drill bits and all that. And, and uh, you know what? Uh, maybe I ran out of patience. Maybe I didn't buy the right drill bits. I'm not sure. But I could not cut into this thing. Um, and then I gave up. So <laughs> what I did, because I wanted that mechanical connection for the handle scales to the blade. So what I ended up doing, since I'm into cord wrap anyway these days, I epoxied on this uh, micarta. That's a it's a checkered knurled micarta handle scale set that's contoured, actually uh, set up for a, a 1911 pistol. So I took that, put those on here, and since it doesn't have the mechanical connection, I figured I would I would do that with cord wrap. And this is not a hardened cord wrap, so if I decide it looks too cheesy or I don't like the way it feels, I can cut it off uh, without much uh, without much difficulty. But I, as it happens, I do like the way it looks, and I do like the way it feels. And uh, so I'm going to leave it on there. Uh, so yesterday, I put an edge on it. As you can see, it is chisel ground. The edge is chisel ground. It's pretty nice, pretty damn sharp now. And the whole blade is chisel ground, so it's flat on this side. And uh, yeah, this is sort of a, a, a Franken knife, sort of a road runner, road runner, sort of a road warrior style knife. And by that, I just mean <laughs> un not, unfinished. It's not a very uh, high fit and finish style knife. I think I've come up to the to the edges uh, of the of the equipment I have, but also the edge of my patience. You know, I, I do this every once in a while. I noodle around and it takes me, you know, forever to actually make a knife that cuts because I'll, I'll work on it and then not work on it for months and months. So finally finished my my little Road Warrior Fred Perrin shank. It's pretty nicely sized. Cuts really well. Uh, I did some feather sticking with it yesterday. You'll you'll love to know. And uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. I just need to make a sheath. That'll take me another year and a half. And uh, then I'll be ready to never carry it. <laughs> so here it is, the Road Warrior Shank, uh, a la Fred Perrin. You know, this looks a bit like something he might make, uh, except his are obviously better. He's a more experienced guy, but uh, there you go. I'm just going to leave it at that. Now, the exciting part of the of the uh, state of the collection is a new knife, and it's my... Eric Kramer made Kramer Custom Knives Voodoo. Oh, and it's in the sheath. This is an excellent sheath with a uh, Tracker Dan. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a Tracker Dan, or it's a Tracker Dan style uh, retention clip, which I love. But look, at, before I even pull it out, this is the package. Look at how thin this is, and I'll compare it to my VSEP. It's quite thin. So... Incidentally, or consequently, it's become a very, very, uh, it's a go-to EDC. It's so thin and so easy to carry in the waistband. And so, very sweet. Look at this thing. So this is 154 cm. It's a hollow ground blade. And I uh, requested the double edge. The, so the secondary edge, the top edge is sharp. And as you can imagine, it's a sharp, it's a sharpened swedge, so it, it comes at a much more um, uh, oblique angle there, but it is sharp, 
and good for mm, kind of the things splitting, gouging, uh, that kind of thing, as opposed to slicing, which this hollow ground blade is great for. This is really, really thin. I mean, this blade stock is, uh, I'm not sure, probably an eighth of an inch, maybe uh, three thirty seconds of an inch. I don't know. I, I need to measure it. Sorry. Uh, but it's also hollow ground really, really nicely. Eric Kramer is a fantastic grinder of steel and uh, it comes to a, a screaming sharp primary edge. This is, uh, so I recently spoke with Eric Kramer. He's going to be on uh, one of the upcoming podcasts. Uh, he was inspired by Persian knives on this one. To me, I always thought it was a modified clip point. To me, it looks like a, a Bowie. Yeah, Eric Kramer coming up episode uh, 220. So keep your eye out for that. Uh, but he said to me that, no, this is, this is actually a Persian inspired blade. And uh, well, you say Persian, I say modified clip point, but let's not call the whole thing off. Look at that. So this thing is an ergonomic dream. It just fits the hand so perfectly. And that's a good thing because that's where you carry your knives. That's where you hold them is, is in your hand, see? So perfect placement for the thumb. If you hold it in saber grip, you have really, really nice jimping here and jimping back here. It's excellent in the reverse grip. Uh, Eric Kramer does Libra fighting. Uh, and the Libra fighting is... Uh, a, technique where they use a lot of tip down edge in sort of pical style and it's almost always here in this reverse grip so it's a neutral enough handle that it's optimized for reverse style grip and reverse kind of fighting if you're going to use it for that or self defense but you know for the more practical more everyday stuff which is what this knife is going to get used for it is uh, also neutral enough to be very comfortable and very uh, wieldy in, in the saber or forward hammer grip. Big fan of this knife, and I just can't get over how much, how thin it is and how much I love that. Like I said, this is the VSEP. You hold it next to it, and the VSEP just is a standard, what is it, like 0.54 inches thick or 0.5 two, five inches thick. And uh, this thing is thinner and sits right next to the love hand. I mean, to the sculpted oblique muscles and uh, gets lost there. You just forget that it's there until you need it. And then boom. And like I said before, this thing has gotten a lot of carry in my, um, what do we call them in this house? Dippa Dippas, or that's something my daughter came up with, or uh, comfy cozies or, you know, sweatpants, pajamas, whatever you don't wear out. Though I've been seeing people wearing their pajamas out like grown men, and I, I want to lecture them, but that's a whole other rant. This thing uh, has been clipping in beautifully to everything I wear. So I know that uh, sports shorts and uh, just shorts in general, which I'm always kind of hesitant to wear fixed blades, this, is, this has been working out amazingly. Check out Eric Kramer on Instagram. He's got some really excellent fixed blades. He also uh, made some really fantastic and ornate and gorgeous folders for a little while. He took a break from that and uh, I have it on good word that he's going to be headed back in that direction uh, in, in this year. At some point uh, in the summer, he's going to start back up with that. So uh, Eric Kramer Voodoo, uh, my newest acquisition and uh, and something that I love. And I spoke earlier uh, about how I been selling a couple of knives. Well, that was, <laughs> this inspired that, you know, I've been, I've been a little bit on a, I've been a little undisciplined lately where, you know, you kind of have to move a few out to bring a few in. And so when I got that, I decided to move, move a few out. One of them moved and uh, we'll see, we'll see about the others. So now, the moment you've all been waiting for. I want to talk about my top 10 unsung heroes of actual cutting chores. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? I mean, these are knives that are, well, a few of them reside in the kitchen junk drawer. One of them hangs next to my tools in the shop down here. Uh, one of them is, well, 
I'll just get into it. You get the idea. They're knives that are just around that are actually used for the most cutting. I do have a VSEP in my pocket today, um, but if uh, I get some nasty cutting chore in the kitchen, it will most likely go to something else like this first one. This is the Ruger, uh, CRKT made Ruger uh, LCK. This came out in a drop point and in this Warncliffe sheep's foot thing, I'm not sure exactly what you call that style blade with such an abrupt tip. Uh, I guess that's a Warncliffe. And it got a lot of very positive press uh, two years ago or so when it first came out. Um, I remember Nick Shabazz ooing and eyeing over it, you know, for such an inexpensive, this was like a $27 knife. And uh, Birdshot IV was huge on board with this. And uh, so I, I went to get one and they were sold out. I mean, it got so much good press. So it took a while to get. Um, and, and it's rare that I am, you know, waiting around for a $27 knife to come in, but it did. And I, I love it. And uh, it got relegated to the kitchen drawer. My wife also loves it. And so um, that's where I ended up putting it. It's been sharpened a few times. This is 8CR13 MOV, but it's hollow ground and very sharp. Gets very thin behind the edge, even though it's a relatively stout blade stock for, for the uh, size of it. So it reminds me a little bit of a straight razor, got to say. And it's got excellent, excellent action. I'm going to use my, my right hand there. Excellent action on washers. Not even sure what kind of washers these are. Can't tell. Can't tell with the lighting I have right here. But uh, So this is a kitchen junk drawer knife. It gets tons and tons of use. And uh, it is an unsung hero. It, it's got kind of a tactical look. It's got a great grip to it. Uh, this FRN is excellent, um, but you never see this in my front right pocket. And that's what I mean by unsung hero. So I'm going to put this down over here. Thank you for your service. And I'm going to move along. The next two knives are, are also in that same junk drawer. So they, they, they all get a bit of play. This is a Buck Stockman that I picked up from Walmart years ago. And uh, this... <laughs> This is a great knife too. This, especially the sheep's foot blade on this. As you know, or may not know, a Stockman is a traditional slip joint knife with three blades. Uh, the main blade is a clip point blade. And then the two secondary blades are the sheep's foot and the spay blade, you know, for spaying animals. Except this one is tiny, so you're only gonna be spaying squirrels with this. But you got the spay blade, the clip point, which has some schmutz on it, and the um, sheep's foot. All great, all get used, but this especially, this uh, sheep's foot blade gets a ton of use. This is uh, packages come in. We did, we used to do HelloFresh and uh, the girls get all these sort of like um, project boxes that come in every month, you know, and um, you know, how to, how to cook for kids and, and you know, that kind of stuff, especially during our quarantine period. We just had endless amounts of these subscription boxes coming in. And uh, this is what usually opened them up, um, especially that, uh, that sheep's foot. Something I really love about this is even though it's an inexpensive knife, look at the bone handles, just beautifully jigged and burned and dyed bone handles here. So junk drawer knife. Uh, the bolsters, I'm not sure what the material are, is. It's not, uh, it's not nickel silver. It's some, something that tarnishes and doesn't, doesn't come back quite that nicely. Uh, so that's what we got. Chinese made. I'm going to put it down here with all blades showing so that you're in the know. There we go. So Junk drawer knife number two. Junk drawer knife number three my brother gave to me. God, it's got to be 25 or 30 years ago at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, so it is the Leatherman side clip. Maybe, maybe less than 30. More than 20, less than 30, we'll say. Side clip referring to, this was their first one with a pocket clip. And uh, wouldn't you know, they chose to go with proprietary 
hardware. I think that's what that is. Yeah, that's a five-pointed star with a with a little thing in the middle. So there's no tightening this clip, but the clip hasn't come off. It's just loose. This thing gets all the use. It gets so much use, but not these pliers so often. It's everything else in here. It's got a, uh, well, yeah, actually the pliers do get a good amount of use if I don't, if I'm too lazy to come down to the basement to get real pliers, though they are painful because they didn't at this point have the technology to round off this part of the scale or this part of the handle. It's a folded over, uh, half folded over sandwiched kind of thing. So you're, you're getting the, you're getting that width of the metal right there when you squeeze down, but you know what? You got to be tough sometimes. But this gets a lot of use because it's got this uh, Phillips head screwdriver on it. And uh, oh, where is it? It's got a pretty decent blade and uh, that's been used to scrape some stuff here and uh, a cap lifter and such. But the, the Phillips screwdriver ends up in the bathroom a lot. I'll be uh, all right. I'll, 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 I'll key you into a, I'll, I'll let you share this sort of personal thing. I'll be in the shower. Sometimes our shower knob for the cold water gets loose and it's an old shower, old hardware that we've had. I don't want to say restored. That's not the right word, but we've had plumbers in to look at it and they're like, okay, if you want to swap all this out, if we're going to be have to tear out the wall and this and that, and, or I could just fix it. So I always say, just fix it. And uh, so it does require a little maintenance from time to time. Sometimes you have to just screw the knob back on <laughs> and that's this. So I just go running a towel around me to the, to the kitchen, grab this, run back in, you know, do the dash. So no one sees you and uh, grab, grab the, uh, grab that, use this. So this sucker gets tons of use. You can see it's kind of rusting on the side because I don't take care of it. It's just one of those things that's always there and always ready. Uh, but receives very little glory. This is the one uh, uh, Leatherman that that has not that has been with me for the longest and hasn't crapped out on me at all. It's uh, it's quite a quite a great thing. I need to get a new Leatherman because I showed you uh, last week uh, the the big one that I have now. I don't remember the model name. Just spontaneously came apart. I, it was in the car in the center console, pulled it out to, to do something with it. And it just like two pieces just kind of came off of it. So I need to get a new one and perhaps I'll travel back in time and get another one of these side clips. Probably not though. All right. Next is a knife that I keep in my shop. That's this room. Uh, over here is the studio about, uh, eight feet over there is the shop and about, uh, four feet over there is the knife room. And about four feet over there is the file room. So it's a very small room, but I, <laughs> it functions uh, in a lot of different ways. The shop area, this is a knife that gets a lot of play when I'm doing especially Kydex stuff or um, with just any any general cutting around that uh, the area with my tools. This is the Mora knife, Mora knife, Mora classic number two. It's got the bulbous red wooden handle and the single quillion guard. I, I sought this one out in particular when I bought it. Uh, obviously, you know, there, there've been many, many modern, more modern Mora knives out there. But when I decided I needed a Scandi blade, this was the first Scandi ground blade I ever got. I really wanted to go classic. I love this old style and uh, it's just very basic. It reminds me a bit of an Opinel like the um, like the fixed bladed version or this the fixed bladed cousin from Sweden you know your your Swedish cousin is coming for the summer uh, and that's what uh, that's what I ended up getting love it uh, this classic comes in a shorter blade it comes in a um, in a one without a guard at all I figured that would be dangerous uh, for how I like to cut myself I figured this this would help me. It, I've seen it also with the double guard. I think that's very hard to find. And there's also a, a version of this called the work knife, I think, that looks very much like this. Maybe it just has a different style blade. You've got the uh, Scandinavian grind. This thing has uh, been sharpened and stropped many a time. It's super sharp. It's the high carbon steel. 
And though it is high carbon, I, I have not taken care of it and it has never rusted or patinaed on me. So it's a, it's a pretty robust um, high carbon steel. Comes in this molded plastic sheath. Incidentally, uh, my daughters are just old enough that I'm letting them kind of go off into the woods uh, down the street a little bit. And they have a little area that they think is secret <laughs> that they're trying to turn into their fort. And uh, my daughter, uh, my older daughter, Eden, um, misplaced her Swiss Army knife, which uh, I felt her pain about that. You know, she was very apologetic, but I feel her pain. Uh, I gave her this to, to carry with her when she when they went uh, this this past weekend. And she really liked it. And I got to say, it looked cool on her. You know, she had her little shorts and whatever. And she had this knife. And of course, I, I also let her know that if any strange dogs or men approach, uh, you know, just stick it in the eye and it'll work. Okay, so that's the Mora. That's my shop knife, the Mora Classic number two. Next is my painting knife. Every time I paint, this is the knife I have on me. And I think it originally started, this is the Spyderco Endura with the blue FRN handle. And I think that I started using this first because of the blue handle. The color was evocative of that painting tape. And for some reason I reached for this, but what a great knife this is. It, it does get a lot of use in trimming. Um, uh, the way I paint, I'll, I'll lay the tape out and then I'll, I'll trim it exactly to the molding. And this does a, a really good job of that. Uh, I also was carrying this yesterday uh, and opened up mail with it. I very rarely care that, carry this. This is very rarely an EDC for me or a, just a carry knife. But it was yesterday and I opened mail with it and it, I forgot how sharp it is. This thing is just incredibly sharp. And I know it doesn't take much to cut paper that's folded on a seam like that, but you can tell, you can just tell the way it slides through and and uh, this VG10 is great steel and it's perhaps an unsung steel at this point you know v VG10 people turn up their noses uh, but I love this knife and I was considering selling it at one point and then I thought why how much am I going to get for it and uh, why why would I bother selling it it's always there for me when I need it uh, uh, during the the painting season which we're coming up on very shortly here. So this is going to get a lot of use. Uh, recently, I also used my uh, Protec TR3 as a painting knife, or no, I'm sorry, the TR2 as a painting knife. Um, but this one, this one will, will always hold that special, special place. Next is my desk knife. This knife sits over to my right. I have a bunch of knives over there, but this is the one I always use uh, when I, I'm sitting at my desk and I need to cut something. And uh, that is the the Buck 112 Ranger, and uh, it is fitted with this quick quick open thing, so you can open it up single handedly. It's brass, so it it fits. 420 HC steel never was so good as how uh, Buck heat treats 420. 420, dude. So this is a, a really great knife. You can see it gets a lot of use uh, from the scratches there on the blade. And I just love the weight of it. Uh, integral brass liner slash bolsters with this Dura wood or whatever they call it. I'm not sure what that wood is. It's it's wood like laminated wood. And it's heavy. It's a boat anchor. So it doesn't get any pocket carry, but it's really sure in hand. Feels great in hand. Uh, I, I happen to cut a lot of paper with this. I, I really cannot stand how paper tears out of pads. We have a lot of paper around here that we're tearing out of pads, either wrapping stuff up or drawing with it and uh, or drawing on it. And this cleanly cuts the paper right out. But uh, also this get this has a past of um, scraping and carving a bit around here too. This was also a micarta, uh, not a micarta, a uh, Kydex knife for a little while. And then not for nothing, but if you have, if you're a fan of the 110 or the 112, these uh, these openers that you affix to the blade work great as little thumb stops too. Just kind of gives you a great ind indexing point and uh, a point of strength if you're horsing through some material. Kydex can sometimes be a problem. So the Buck 112 Ranger. 
an unsung cutting hero in my collection, but also kind of an unsung hero out there. The It's Bigger Brother, the 110, gets so much attention and uh, so much treatment and, and retreatment that uh, the 112 is a, is a nice option. Though, you know, that three-inch blade and that 70-pound handle uh, makes, makes carrying interesting. Uh, so I guess that's why they've done uh, some of the lightweight versions of it. Next is a bathroom sentinel. This, uh, you know, as you know, I have a number of knives in the bathroom. One of them is in the shower. It's one of those plastic karambits from Cold Steel, just in case, you know, just in case my life goes from, you know, relatively sedate suburban dad to Jason Bourne while I'm in the shower. I've got it covered. Uh, but this is once I step out of the shower, I have this. This is the CRKT Stinger. It's a dagger. Uh, it's it's cast. What is this? Uh, forged 1050 steel. Um, this was a gift from my brother-in-law years ago. And uh, this one you definitely have to make sure since it lives in the bathroom and, and, uh, and can take on moisture. I keep the blade oiled because these edges have rusted before. This one I have in there, all the knives in the in the bathroom, except for the one in the shower, have this red cord on it, so it can be identified quickly. Uh, and I you know, let my wife know, you just look for the red cord if you need a knife. Uh, so this one I have in there as like a fighting knife, you know, because of the, of the bathroom fighting problem. But uh, really what it gets used for is opening endless, products that keep finding their way in there. I know my wife uses it a lot. Uh, she gets more, way more jams and jellies than I do for the bathroom, but uh, soap, uh, we get the soap that comes wrapped in cellophane and this uh, liberates the soap from its packaging so I don't have to tear it out like an animal. I can use a knife like a man and uh, this is the one I use. Uh, this is a very cool knife. This is designed by A.G. Russell, by the way. And you can find some very fancy versions of, of this by the late, great A.G. Russell. But I have uh, this, this uh, lanyard here is not just for locating it visually. It's also for putting over the palm. So in case you have to actually use it and thrust with it, your hand's not slipping up onto that blade. So this sort of retains it in your hands as well. This sheath, I had a guy that I did martial arts with who carried this all the time in this sheath, which I always thought was nice, but maybe not that retentive. Uh, and he carried it upside down on his belt and rode a motorcycle everywhere. And he said it never bounced out, never came out of the sheath. It was like, so I was very impressed by that. Uh, that would not have been what I thought the deal was. Uh, you can put it, put it sideways in your sheath like this. That's kind of how it's optimized in scout carry. Or if you have a tiny, tiny little belt, I guess you can you can attach it. Or I guess these are for Molly attachments or something. Anyway, this is the CRKT made um, AG Russell designed sting. And, and this is the bathroom sentinel, uh, which actually just liberates soap from its packaging. Two, let's see, three more. And, and uh, oh, these are good. Here it is. The classic. I mean, this gets so much use. The Victorinox classic. These are my work keys. Uh, I got my little thing to hang it on my belt, which I never do, and uh, a little flashlight, which I know you torch guys are bristling at. Uh, but I will be convinced eventually. But this thing gets used all the time for the tweezers, the toothpick, the scissors, most especially these scissors. I love the Victorinox scissors more than any other scissors on God's green earth. And these are the small ones, obviously, because they're on the classic. These get used quite a bit uh, for skin, uh, removal of nasty, nasty skin and stuff that's hanging off. But also this acute little blade works great. And the nail tool, this nail file gets it a lot too. Uh, believe it or not, I will file my nails from time to time because after they get cut, they are sharp along the edges and this just does it. This gets used a lot. It's not glorious. This is a true unsung hero because it's uh, small and puny, but man, does it get a lot of use. And uh, I figured I needed to mention it here.
to call this unsung might be a little disingenuous because I have spoken about this before uh, with 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 great enthusiasm. But my old Vaquero Grande from Cold Steel, uh, late 90s edition um, Vaquero Grande has done more cutting around here than almost anything else because I've had it longer than almost anything else. And uh, for a while, I carried it in my waistband like a total fool way back when in New York City. So don't come and try and arrest me now for some crime I did long, long ago. But this would have landed me straight in Rikers, which I would not have been uh, equipped to handle without something like this. And uh, but I I carried it anyway. And since moving to the suburbs, this thing has been relegated to divining work, to backyard work and with this sinuous and serrated blade, it is excellent for that kind of stuff, for vegetation and for fibrous things like rope and um, twine that comes around uh, various things you get for the backyard, mulches and stuff, not mulches, but uh, when we've gotten new plants and saplings and stuff like that, I have sharpened the, I have resharpened these, uh, serrations you can see maybe up close uh, uh numerous times the big scoops anyway the little scoops are just a little too small and, the, and those little teeth have broken off or worn down in a lot of these areas here but this this knife has just done an amazing job and i call this unsung because you know i have a collection of large folding cold steel knives and this one uh, though it is the oldest and the most used gets the least amount of attention because it is the least flashy. It's got the old style Vaquero uh, uh, blade style, it's a, which means it's a little thinner uh, compared to its length and it's a little more curved compared to the others. Um, maybe, maybe even an awkward design, slightly awkward, but man, do I love it. I love the way it looks. I love the way it works. And uh, this, so this has been a, a great, unsung hero unsung recently anyway i've been singing the praises of other large cold steels so um this one is a true cutter last but not least is another cold steel surprise surprise yep it's the trail master this trail master has uh let's see if i can get this in camera there there we go. This trail master has been with me for uh, since about 98, 99. You can see how the uh, handle has been worn away here. This is a, that rubberized craton. Um, it is not yet off gassed to the point where it's sticky or anything like that, but it's still grippy. It's been worn away. It's got this beautiful thick brass uh, guard and this incredibly stout uh, what is this? I, it might be five sixteenths of an inch thick blade. It is just a thick wedge-like blade. You've got a swedge that comes to a zero grind, so you can really use this. If this were a fighting knife, you could use this swedge to great, great effect on a on a back cut, on a splitting flick cut kind of thing, and. Uh, that works great, but this edge has always been screamingly sharp. I recently took it to my uh, my belt grinder, put a new edge on it, and uh, probably didn't really need it. And I, I may have, uh, well, in some places I may have dulled it ever so slightly. Um, but this is carbon V steel, or is that carbon five? I, I, I can never tell. Do you say carbon V or carbon five? Is that like a, a V? letter V or is that a Roman numeral five? I don't know. Does it matter? It's like uh, 16 candles. You don't spell it, son. You eat it. Well, in this case, you don't say it. You use it. You cut with it. And uh, so this has done a lot of outdoor cutting in terms of saplings. We have, uh, we have this disgusting white pine next door. I'm not a huge fan of white pines. I love trees and such, but white pines are just a pain. Plus, you're always wondering when it's going to fall on your house. And uh, this one drops limbs like you wouldn't believe. And uh, it's not ours, it's our neighbors. But anyway, uh, so I have cut those limbs up and uh, used this and I cannot get that tar off. This is the sap. Um, I think denatured alcohol is what I need to get maybe. 
I've, I've done a, I've used a number of solutions and it hasn't removed that, that silly sap. I should just, uh, next time I go out and use it for something like that uh, on sappy material, I will coat it with WD-40. Uh, I think that's the nut and fancy way of doing it. And then it just slips through. I also use this when we have our um, outdoor family fire pit nights. Uh, this is the knife that I use to make kindling. It works great. It does uh, chew up your baton because of that zero ground sharpened uh, swedge there. But the geometry of the blade itself just splits and batons the wood so perfectly. And I got to be honest, uh, yes, I started batoning because I thought it was really cool and a great way to use your knives. But uh, I actually feel much more safe batoning, uh, batoning to get kindling than I would using a hatchet. And maybe that's just because I don't use a hatchet much and I feel less comfortable with it. But this right here, placed on the back of a log and then pounded through with another stick, Man, that is the best way for me, anyway, to get that fine, those little pieces of kindling. And um, yeah. And since I have, uh, since I have, I smoke a cigar now once a, once a week on the weekends. I think I, I've sort of, I've sort of given up on some vices and I figure I, you can't give up all your vices. It's, uh, it's like, uh, like Lincoln said, you can't trust a man with no vices. So, um, uh, I think we're going to be doing a lot more, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, fire pitting, because it's a great excuse to be out with the family smoking a cigar, but them not smelling it. Uh, I don't know. We'll see how that works out. Anyway, thanks for sticking around this long to find out what my top 10 unsung heroes of actual cutting chores are. These knives are all awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that I can have all of these luxury items. Now, the ones I've shown you today aren't necessarily luxury items. They're much more tools. But the reason I use these is because I have luxury items, these kind of knives, the VSEPs, the Voodoos, the GEC knives. You know, they're they're completely, well, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to put it that way. I'm just going to say they are luxury items, and I'm very lucky to, to, to be able to have them. And um, well, you know, there, there are certain things you know, I don't, I don't have big, fancy, expensive cars. I have big, fancy, expensive knives. And that's, that's how I'll leave it. Anyway, uh, join us on Patreon. Join the Patreon group. Make yourself eligible for the monthly knife giveaway, uh, which is always a really, really good and fun thing. Again, thanks to the two new patrons, Sean and Ryan. Your patronage is greatly appreciated. And we're very happy to have you on board. Also, Check out uh, Thursday Night Knives tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, streaming live right here on YouTube and join the conversation. Also, keep your eyes open for our close-up videos. I show you close-up uh, and my feelings on uh, various knives right here on the cutting board under the knife cam. And, of course, our Sunday interview shows, which are – I love every aspect of this. But man, I love doing those interviews, and meeting, the, meeting the people that make this knife world happen. All right. So for Jim, who's been working his magic behind the switcher, I'd like to say have a great week. My name is Bob DeMarco, and don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast